Welcome everyone to the Ethereum 2.0 um, client panel discussion. The idea with this is to, uh, well after this morning's presentations where we saw lots of the work that's been done um, and, and been given insight into to, to some of the solutions that have come up with, to explore more how we move on from here, um, in particular how do we do that together. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, to, to togetherness, I think, in general, in Ethereum 2.0, there's there's um, many of the, the the design aspects have been centered around trying to coordinate people, um, be that through the use of technologies that other people are using, Wasm, Lib P2P, uh, BLS standardization, etc., to the um, multi-cliented uh, approach we're taking, um, and uh, I think that's a really powerful a powerful thing as we've we, we've we've seen. Um, and so I think a good place to, to, to start off with is uh, something we had uh, quite recently, um, which was the, the Interop event. Um, this, this was a great, uh, a great opportunity where we locked, well, some <laughs> basically locked a bunch of people in a room to see what happened. Um, and, and the results of this experiment was uh, we got seven clients uh, speaking to each other, which is uh, pretty, pretty freaking incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so now that we've achieved that, I think, uh, that's that that's allowed us to, to 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 get a lot further along this this route. So um, I think we should have some introductions uh, before we quickly dive into this. So uh, if you can start uh, down that side and uh, have everyone just say their name, what who they're working on, and uh, what was the sort of one thing that they took from 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 Interop, or what's the the the, the one uh, maybe the, the 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 main thing that you guys are now working on as a result of Interop. Uh, hey, I'm Ben. I'm just standing in for uh, the great Joe DeLong on this panel. I kind of assembled the Artemis team a year ago. Um, I'm best better known for what's new in ETH2 uh, these days. Um, I was at Interop, and it was awesome. Um, takeaways, I think it's time to press on to production now. We've proved the concept. It, it works. We, we can interoperate. It's, it's very cool. But now we're moving into a new phase with, with Artemis. Uh, and handing it over to the production team to do all the stuff like writing documentation and and uh, and searching the uh, comments for to do and all that uh, all that good stuff. Hey everyone, I'm Raul from Prismatic Labs. Uh, I was unfortunately not at Interop, but uh, remotely helping out the teams there and figuring out kind of how to get people on board Prism. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways was uh, getting everyone to easily run a beacon chain and a validator. Uh, made uh, like we had to make it easy for everyone, um, and it improved a lot of our local development a lot. Uh, it made it very very easy uh, to launch a beacon chain with n number of deterministic validators. Um, so that sort of standardization that came out of the effort um, made our lives easier, and hopefully others' lives easier. So. Hey everyone, I'm Alex Stokes. I work on Trinity, which is the Python implementation of ETH2O. Uh, yeah, Interop was great, as we'll probably all tell you here. Uh, the biggest thing I think we probably all saw across the board was, yeah, just having like these sort of coordinated starts and like getting these test nets to actually like all go at the same time. We have a large number of clients, and so uh, we have some extra fun just like wrangling all these cats. Uh, there's like a bunch of little stuff that we saw sort of uh, specific to Trinity from the interop. And uh, the big thing that we'll probably be focusing on longer term over like the next, I don't know, let's say three to six months is a uh, heavy focus on performance. Like I said, we're a Python client, so we kind of have a performance penalty we incur de facto. Uh, so we'll be doing a lot of, a lot of optimization there. Uh, we are looking at dropping our like really sort of tight loops and things uh, into Rust. So we've had some work on like Rust modules in Python, which is fun. And yeah, that's about it. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul. Uh, I work on Lighthouse. It's uh, one of the Rust implementations. Uh, I think one of the great things that came from Interop uh, was just a lot of scripts that we can use to, to build each other. So Yatsik uh, built a bunch of scripts, which was great. Um, so now we have, we have a bunch of tools that we can use uh, by ourselves to test with other clients. Um, so that really helps uh, reduce the, the friction uh, that we can, before we can test our client against others. Uh, what we're working on now, uh, after Interop, uh, we're basically f targeting feature completeness. Um, we have an RFP for a security review out there, so we're, we're preparing for that. 
um, and we're working on trying to take our client uh, into the sort of the tens of thousands of validator um, ranges and above uh, to make sure that we can uh, run nice and quickly and efficiently with uh, production level numbers of validators. Hi, I'm Zachary from the Nimbus team. Uh, a lesson that we learned from Interop, I guess, is the importance of testing. And our success was uh, largely due to the very well prepared test suite and where there was uh, bumps along the road. But this is uh, places where the tests are kind of missing. Uh, I would repeat what Paul, so, uh, Paul said, that uh, one of the most valuable takeaways was these scripts that allow us now to run uh, multi-client test nets. And now uh, I think we should uh, all keep improving uh, on them. And uh, regarding the future of uh, Nimbus client, we will be planning, we will be publishing very shortly our roadmap for getting Nimbus uh, production ready. And we hope to do that in the next uh, six months. Hi, I'm Dejun uh, from Runtime Verification. So we <laughs> develop K kind of client, um, but we are not really just running the client, but just formally verifying the clients. So, uh, but I hope that some crazy idea or crazy users use our K <laughs> client <laughs> as uh, just adding another diversity and uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so far we just formal verification per force. When will it be a PK? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Mikhail. Uh, I'm from Harmony team. And the interop went very well. And uh, I even didn't expect it. It was so productive. Um, as a follow up, so we are continuing to work on the uh, Fork choice tests, like a complex test. Um, also, we need to finish sync, and uh, was thinking about to start working on BLS stuff, finishing discovery. And uh, the main takeaway from Interop is that we are merging efforts with Artemis, so we probably can uh, uh, avo avoid this uh, production ready stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, I'm Wei from uh, Party, uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, I, I, we didn't join the interop on site, but I was doing some similar interop stuff uh, at home, uh, trying to get it work, put some old nights. It mostly works. I think the most uh, important lessons we learned is still testing. So uh, uh, we were uh, one or two patch version behind, but even even except that, we still have like one or two consensus bugs found during the interop that doesn't pick up the test, uh, doesn't pick up as a test. We passed all the tests before. Uh, so I think that's the biggest lesson we learned. Testing is really important. Also, I forgot to say that uh, we tested uh, GVM with P2P as well as our client and he fixed some bugs and it's now compatible at least uh, the stack that used for interop is now compatible with uh, all other implementation like JavaScript, Python, and Rust and Go. Uh, I also just want to use this moment to toss out a PSA. Uh, we're all using the same BLS library at the moment, I believe. Yeah. So if uh, anyone out there wants to write a BLS implementation, more implementations is better. Uh, on the note of uh, BLS implementations, the um, standardization efforts have been uh, charging forward um, and uh, we have some more reference implementations from the, those efforts. So uh, hopefully within the next one month or so we should have what is the, the, the final specification for BLS, uh, which is really a, a major step forward and means that basically then that's the, 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 to me the last hurdle in terms of specification that's left. Um, yeah, so moving on. Um, we, we, we've, we've had all these uh, these interop events, but uh, we need to now to start transitioning to uh, more organic starting up of these events and and allowing uh, nodes or uh, clients to properly sync with one another. Uh, with with uh, we previously used uh, scripts and uh, files to start up uh, these these test nets, but to have more um, 
it's a way we allow validators to join into your network and uh, transitioning into uh, proper test nets. Um, so I would be interested to hear comments on uh, well, what, how, how we can do this and sort of what are the challenges and, and what are the next steps in, in, in these regards. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, a huge step forward from what we had at Interop uh, would be sort of testing out uh, our ETH1 integration. Uh, I think most of the clients have at least some form of it. Uh, but essentially, this would be like having you know some ETH1 testnet, uh, ideally one that we kind of all could easily, uh, for example, produce ETH for or spin up or spin down as we need. Uh, and then use that to kind of test, okay, like you're saying, here's a real world setting where it's like there's an ETH1 network, we then have this ETH2 deployment, uh, how can we actually have validators join and leave, but mainly join? Uh, yeah. I think it's time for specialization. I think we're gonna see like all the clients at this point, now that we know we can talk and we know like we have a baseline, we're gonna see everybody kind of splitting down, isolating and like going down um, Basically, ch challenging you know their languages and their respective implementations to whatever it is that like their original goal was set out to be. Um, I think that's probably what we'll see like happen in the next six months. Uh, for us as well, the, uh, the very next milestone is uh, running test nets connected to E1, and uh, for this so we've been following uh, the lead of uh, Prism, and uh, we have been publishing a deposit contract on the Gorli network. And uh, I expect that uh, we will have some interoperability with, uh, they will be able to use our contract and they'll be using, able to use theirs and so on. And uh, there have been uh, some talks in the, here for the pre last few days. Uh, a lot of the clients agree that uh, it would be beneficial if we set up a um, shared organization on GitHub where everybody has uh, commit rights and where we can work on and improve this uh, scripts that allow each developer to launch test nets on their own <coughs> computer, on their own environment. So I see two directions. One is uh, public facing test nets running on E1, and then the ability for everyone to just make quick local setups uh, for quick validation. Yeah, uh, echoing that, we really enjoy using Gorli. I think Gorli is becoming a lot more of a de facto standard as well for like ETH1 uh, devs to test out smart contracts and it's been really nice to try out deposits. Um, another big effort is the ARP is like the API standardization effort uh, that will come over the coming months. So there's a lot of talk about not having people use a CLI to stake, to run validators. Um, you know, can we have a standardized API that allows people to build things, interesting things like wallet explorers, uh, other things that allow you to interact with the chain. Um, and that will be a really critical effort over the coming months as well. So. On the note of uh, sharing deposit contracts, do you think it's worth then having one centralized deposit contract on Gurley or, or similar? Well, for a lot of these net, net, test nets, it makes a lot of sense to restart them frequ frequently. Mm -hmm. And then uh, nothing prevents you from having uh, multiple deposit contracts being active at the same time. You know, basically, the client only needs to specify the address of the deposit contract that you'll be using. Just in terms of the, the shared deposit contract, I think something that would be nice too would be uh, a common onboarding uh, process for validators. I think the EF was maybe considering about jumping on that. So um, yeah, it'd be nice if we don't all have to build you know, a million different little validator onboarding things uh, than to be superseded um, by a, an official one coming out. We also probably want to test this um, beacon chain start for many times because it could be a huge point of failure. I mean, that kicking off from ETH1 uh, chain to the beacon chain. So that's probably uh, worth to focus on as well. Yeah, definitely. We, we, we don't want to find that out in, in production. Um. <laughs> um, and and uh, on, on that topic, I think it would also be worth discussing what are the, uh, what are valid criteria or how would we decide that uh, we are ready to, to do this mainnet launch. So uh, I agree one of them should be that we've had um, launches um, based, based off ETH1 and uh, the, the, these uh, uh, starts, but how do we actually decide that this is the finalized 
uh, version, both in terms of we can specify minimum ETH deposits and that kind of thing, but also uh, more in terms of how what we require of clients to be able to participate in these networks um, and, and how do we say that this client should should or shouldn't participate. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be some definitive thing, but what what is a good signal for deciding that a client is ready for participating in, in a mainnet launch? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's obviously a big question. Um, at a high level, right, like, I would expect we want this to be actually fairly community-driven, probably, like, highly directed by the client developers themselves. Um, obviously, there's things like uptime and performance and stuff, right? So, for example, if we end up with, like, a ton of early validators, we all want clients to be able to handle that many validators. Uh, I know, for example, Trinity, like, can't scale to, like, the theoretical max right now. Like, we just don't have the performance. We'll get there, but we're not there yet. Um, so these types of things are like really important qualifications. Uh, you know, at a certain point, it's hard to say like, "Are you ready?" You can always defer and like do more testing. So at a certain point, you just have to like, you know, uh, I'll say, "Well, these are all sounding really negative." Uh, I was gonna say jump off the cliff or something, but <laughs> uh, yeah. Hopefully, we know it when we see it, and we're like, "Okay, we all feel good, and here we go." Yeah, I agree though. Sorry, uh, that uh, there should be some. Uh, we should start testing with some of the parameters that affect the performance of the network. We should start validating that uh, each of the clients is ready for this. But our own roadmap is uh, also built around uh, the need for security for performing security audit on our code, and uh, this is a pretty complicated uh, thing to plan out because uh, it requires you to freeze a lot of the code. So we are uh, currently creating a plan that would allow us to uh, create sort of a pipeline for uh, smaller and smaller components that will go through audit and then bigger and bigger parts until we are ready to launch. Yeah, I was going to comment uh, along the same lines. I mean, in this network, you can't prevent anyone from saying I'm a validator and, and being part of the network. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. Um, so it requires client teams need to take responsibility um, uh, on the one hand. And so I think exactly right, audits uh, are going to be important. One of the very striking differences between Ethereum 2 and Ethereum 1 is that in ETH 2, we need to do online signing. You have to have your uh, key available to sign in real time which is something that all the ETH1 clients uh, and nodes have moved away from over the years because it is really hard to do it securely. So that's going to be a critical point where we need to focus uh, audit uh, and security effort uh, on that. And on the other hand, users need to be kind of wise uh, as well because they have to choose a client in which to, to run and to stake and so forth. And I think the best thing we can do there is probably to have some... Um, joint benchmark suite or, you know, some make, it's all about information, right, and making it consistent and so people can compare and contrast and, you know, understand which is the client that meets their, their, their needs. But, yeah, I'd definitely like to see a diversity. I think it would be a shame if the network were dominated by one client, more than 50% on, on one client would be, would be a pity. Um, I guess another point of, point of importance is, is formally verify the the safety and liveliness of the beacon chain. Um, so, uh, I mean, as you all know, that uh, I mean, the, in the paper-wise, the paper that proved the, these two properties on that the abstract model of the beacon chain. But reality is, the implementation has quite a lot of the optimization and also it's slightly different the finalization rules. So, you just make sure that those uh, differences doesn't actually break the safety and liveliness. So yeah, that's our actually goal in our end. Um, we wanted to finish the form verification before <laughs> others are actually ready to release. So I um, have to stop. Yeah, and the, the safety of all our clients relies on this assumption that someone's going to slash bad people. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone that's got a, um, a slasher working that can, that can efficiently run, uh, that can efficiently cover the, the distance that we need uh, and it's still in research as to you know how exactly can we how can we store all of the previous votes uh, and efficiently search them. Um, so we're really we're definitely going to need uh, slashes out there 
and I think they're going to have to have some degree of review uh, and guarantee that you know they're watching and they'll get you. Adding on to that quickly, we also need like slashing protection, right? So like uh, in terms of uh, like infrastructure providers or people that are, they just don't want some sort of crazy situation with their infra to cause them to double propose uh, or double sign. So that's also something that needs to be built in um, and users will be asking for that. I totally agree with everything that's been said and want just to add that we might probably need some more QA stuff like fuzzing. We want to do cross-client fuzzing to find tricky consensus breaks that could not be probably found. It could not be probably found uh, during the test net runs, and also we need to expose a basic interface to chain data to build uh, even primitive block explorers around that, and to get some network monitors to understand what is going on. So yeah, that's that's my point. Another fun thing leading up to production would be incentivized test nets. Uh, so in the Cosmos community, they've done some of this with the game of stakes. It'd be fun if we do the same thing, get together a prize pool. And the idea is we have a test net, public test net, anyone can come and go and then try to keep the test net alive. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing would be like actually talking to validators or potential validators and like getting their input sort of in like a, a product feedback type setting. I think we were all very focused on like the spec and like the engineering and like making really nice sexy clients. Uh, but definitely it's like for phase zero, who are the users of these things? Well, validators. So talking to operators of validating the validation pools and just not necessarily just pools, but validators in general and um, yeah, seeing, seeing how that process unfolds. Sorry, one more. Uh, I think we need uh, some interest from uh, external, uh, I guess, non-client developer team UI people. So I think a lot of the client developers were systems programmers, um, and the idea of choosing a color makes us sweat. Um, <laughs> so it'd be great to have, um, and we don't, we don't, I think at the moment have uh, maybe a few people that are like you know front-end devs that are that are interested in building UIs for this, uh, and it'd be great to have um, these things uh, as a common good that lives outside of the client teams that gets the love that they deserve. And on top of that, I think it's uh, very important for the, the general validator experiences to, to um, not, not only just help them with the general running of the clients, but what happens when validators get slashed? How do we notify them of this? Or um, uh, when there's, there's major chain consensus, how do you, if, if your client's not updating or there's something, there's, there's some fundamental issue, how do we notify clients like of these problems? And I mean, we could trivially have some central solution which sends you an email or something, but having people register their validators with such a thing is a kind of scary concept from a privacy standpoint. So how can we, how can we enable these kinds of things which I think are also very important uh, for, the, for, for the community and, and to help validators understand A, what their client's doing and uh, how they can stay on top of things. Cool. Um, well, uh, with that, I think as we're heading into the final minutes here, I'd like to uh, open the floor to questions for anyone who'd like to talk about anything related to the immediate future of E3.0. Uh, I'm somewhat forwarding this question from uh, Philippe Castingay from Horizon Games and the Fairwind Ponzi scheme revelation. Um, my name's John Marlin. I do security audits, so I'm not a dap dev, but I know a lot about smart contracts. And um, his question is about like the migration process uh, and uh, if there will be, if there are plans for doing any um, migration testing for uh, dApps moving to the ETH2 mainnet or testnet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, definitely. So the, um, the, the the migration from ETH1 to ETH2 is clearly something that came up uh, in the, the, the discussions yesterday too and, and is a very important thing and clearly a pain point for the community. I think it's something everyone is nervous about. We have this great community within Ethereum 1. How can we, we, we transfer that as seamlessly as possible? We don't want bugs in any of these scenarios. Um, the, 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 the challenge with answering this question is that right now, 
Um, we have such flexibility in the space that it's very hard to answer exactly what this is going to look like. So it is some form of uh, moving routes between ETH1 and ETH2. Um, and uh, we, we, the, we will have an execution engine which allows ETH1 to run uh, very similarly to how it does right now, and that will be uh, very well tested for, for these kinds of purposes. But I think the, 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 the challenge here is we're trying uh, with, with these execution environments that allow us such flexibilities and so many possibilities, we're trying to not lock ourselves down to, to, to committing to saying exactly this is how it's going to work right now, uh, because that starts closing down the, the design space for us and, uh, and, and could ultimately end up in a worse product. So the, 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 the answer to that is yes, it will be tested. There will be some migration path. Exactly what that looks like, I can't specify right now, but we, that, 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 that will definitely exist and is vital for, for, for the continuation of uh, uh, Ethereum 2.0. And just to add on to that, like concretely, there's definitely an intention to essentially move ETH1 into the new ETH2 infrastructure in a way that you wouldn't have to migrate your DAP and it would just continue to run. Um, not quite seamlessly. There'll be some sort of metadata updates of like, oh, new network, new chain, that sort of thing. Uh, but in terms of like, you wouldn't have to like rewrite your DAP or like do these things. Um, that being said, there will be an opt-in upgrade path to go to perhaps this new type of EVM EE that Carl was alluding to, uh, which you'd get like a lot of, honestly, like great improvements on top of what we have today. So uh, yeah, keep an eye out. And, and I think a lot of this ties into what uh, Greg's presentation was on earlier on how do we making uh, connections and building common tooling between these uh, these frameworks. And uh, it's very important to have these intermediate tools between the, the, the two chains. It's totally, uh, having an easy path for upgrades is definitely important and, and it'll be there. Something else worth considering too is that, you know, if you, if, if you've just gone from like this pocket calculator to this like multi-core, like thousand times faster machine, um, the pe perhaps a refactor is, um, is, is going to be important for a lot of the dApps. Like um, we're not, not saying that like you're going to have to refactor, but you got a lot to do. Like you, you got a whole new space to play in now. So um, it, it, might, it might be a refactor might be what you end up choose doing because it'll be better for your, your customers or not customers, people that are using your thing, opting in without any control from you. Where is this conversation happening? Where do you guys like, you know, interact with the DAP dev community so they can ask those questions it's, online? Hey, I, I can speak on behalf of that a little bit. Like, we're a little bit early still. You know, that's like phase two. And to be quite frank, a lot of the confusion around this is because like some of the, as Carl explains it, like the design space is so open, but it makes it also super complicated. Like a lot of people have to like rethink the way this is. I mean, how long did it take most developers to actually understand the EVM? Like two years, like before people are like fully understood. It. So it's going to take some time to understand these new concepts. Um, and once that happens, you'll see a lot better. Um, I don't think it's immediate to fully discuss with them. I think the first priority is just talking with like tooling teams to understand how we can better help them and concurrently going with adapt developers. Yeah, the, the Quilt team deserves a plug here too. They're building a, uh, a simulator so that you can build um, EEs or test on top of EEs uh, without needing all of the chain infrastructure. You can just start a process and start start testing. So uh, I think this is something that's going to really enable DAP developers, developers to get involved because it's a bit a bit low level at the moment, I think, for them. Um, but it's opening up to them. Hey, um, so we were at Interrupt 2 with White Block, and uh, we're very grateful. Um, I think we'd, it was fun to work with all of you. Um, we did a couple changes. So that's also an announcement for ChainSafe in particular. So we support Alpine. So we don't need <laughs> to mess around. If you, Alpine for Docker images. Oh, okay. So uh, it would be pretty easy for us to set up a testnet with your stuff. Uh, I think we just, do you have a Docker image? OK, cool. And uh, Wade, do you have a Docker image as well? <laughs> OK, all right. So um, if we can help in any way, uh, we're here to help. Right? DEF is giving us like, credits and funds for that. So um, please involve us, and we'll be happy to help.
Um, a couple of you, you know, um, probably know like some of the ETH, ETH1 core core devs, but usually a lot of them are kind of like detached. So it's like if um, if there were some things with ETH2 designs that you would want them to like try to look at, like um, maybe e each of you, it's like what what is it that you would really like them to look at? Because there's a lot of um, brain power there as well. Thanks. Sync strategies. So uh, we're running out of time. So uh, can we use this as like sort of a, a wrapping up thing? As the what? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, data serialization. Um, API standardization efforts. Yep. Okay, this is not just a single line. Uh, so working on Trinity, we actually have a focus of both ETH1 and ETH2. So uh, I actually feel like I've been exposed a lot to a lot of the ETH1 efforts and ongoings and things. And like really from what I've seen, like both groups of quote core devs are like starting to really just tackle the same questions. Um, like a big one that comes to mind is like state management and things. Uh, we obviously want to like, you know, we've seen what, ha what has happened on ETH1 in terms of the state growing and growing and growing. And uh, we want to, you know, basically find a solution in ETH2 where like that's not going to be a problem. Um, and yeah, like a lot of, there's a lot of cool ideas around like stateless clients and things that again have application in both domains. Um, I'd be I think a good thing we can learn is what to and not do with um, in terms of governance. Um, we, what we have right now with Ether point two is uh, Ether two point zero uh, is uh, the, the the research team I think leads a lot of the the decisions, and so there's sort of a central shelling point which exists much less in Ethereum one point zero. And the idea is that the the research team wants to have less and less of this role. Um, but how can we do this in a a, a manner that prevents deadlock and allows for continuous innovation? Um, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from ETH 1.0 there. I'd be willing to take anything. Uh, I'll, I'll take any advice from any of the people that have been, been building ETH 1 or blockchains or people like Wei. Any, anything they've got, bring it here. Keen for it. I think there's a lot of we can learn about uh, light plans, how to create light plans from ETH 1. And uh, on the other hand, uh, ETH 1 will greatly benefit from the fact that uh, the E2 chain will be finalizing E1 as well, so it would be much easier to create efficient light plans for E1. But uh, the incentivation schemes, uh, the load balancing of the requests, this is, these are areas where we can uh, share the solutions. And kind of on that ground, I'm kind of excited about the possibility of E1 uh, incorporating lib P2P support in some way. This is uh, something that's possible in the future. Yeah. Okay. okay, probably, um, yeah, I'd like to take advices with uh, network reputation systems, uh, connection managers, and sync strategy, and uh, optimized incremental storage for uh, the state. Yeah, that's it. I'm actually mostly like related to both East one and East two. I'm actually both care like a lot about the backward capability issue. Uh, like the thing is for like currently like probably all of you know that in East one we have the uh, a, a a breaking change that creates a lot of conflict. I hope we can try to. Uh, avoid the same situation on ETH2 by designing the execution engine uh, better, like make it forward compatible from the beginning. Uh, I think that's something quite important. It's also really important to consider uh, future changes of web WebAssembly because there, there will be upgrades that are versionless. That's how the web works. Uh, that will be how WebAssembly specification works. So how do we incorporate those new features adopted in WebAssembly into our uh, WebAssembly execution engine in S2. I think that's also something uh, that's quite important to consider. Just quickly before Carl wraps this up, uh, I just wanted to just to announce that uh, we're looking for a senior Rust developer. If you are a Rust <laughs> developer and you want to work on S2, come talk to us. Thank you.
Cool. Well, uh, thanks everyone for attending that. Thank you to uh, all of the, the clients represented here. Um, and uh, I'm really like excited to see the, 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 the work that's going to happen. These, these incentivized test nets, this mainnet launch, which is like this, this incredible event. Um, and then this time next year, I look forward to seeing all of you back here on stage. Hopefully we can talk about uh, these experiences we've had all in good light. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's very exciting to see where this is going. Thank you. Thank you.